So another nonlinear phenomenon is what we refer to as ferroresonance. And this is due to the fact that if I have capacitance and inductance in series, there's going to be a frequency where this equivalent impedance goes to zero. That's going to result in high currents and also high voltages in the circuit. And one thing that complicates this is this nonlinear B to H relationship, because what this is going to give us, this is going to give us a nonlinear inductance as well. So anyway, here's, here's a linear circuit where we have um, circuit resonance occurring. And we, we know that the impedance of the transformer is given by J omega times L. The impedance of this capacitance is given by 1 over J omega C. All right. Now, resonance occurs in this particular situation, if I have no resistance, where these two impedances add up to zero. All right. And if you solve for the, the frequency at which this occurs at, the frequency that it occurs at is given by 1 over the square root of LC. And so the, the issue you run into um, on these particular situations is, uh, is this is going to interact with such a way um, to occur at frequencies that you, you can actually encounter in practice. Because if you have resonance, you have series resonance, again, this is going to cause a large current flow. And whenever you have a large current flow, it's going to cause a large value of voltage across your inductance and also a large maybe a large value of voltage across your capacitance. But what we're more concerned about, since usually the inductance dominates, is this particular overvoltage right here. So anyway, let's let's look at the linear case, linear circuit case, and let's see what happens as this inductance becomes nonlinear. So if I have a linear circuit, I'm only going to have one operating point associated with it. And the way we figure we can kind of view that operating point would be, let's suppose the voltage is going to be having magnitude of E and it's going to be at angle zero degrees. The voltage across the capacitance is going to be 1 over J omega C um, times the current going through it. And let's suppose we've got a circuit that's dominated by the series inductance. In other words, what this means is that the inductance dominates such that the current's going to be lagging the voltage by 9 degrees. So if I have 1 over J omega C times a current magnitude at an angle minus 9 degrees, then basically what this is going to give us is it's going to give us a situation where these angles right here are going to, to cancel. And VC is just going to be given by minus I divided by omega C. So if I have a current magnitude I, um, then VC is going to be minus I divided by omega C. So if I have a source voltage uh, that has this magnitude of E, basically it's a, it's a real number. VC is a real number. Then when we talk about the voltage across the inductor, this is going to be VS minus VC if you go back to this particular circuit. Um, Basically, VL is going to be VS minus VC. And this is going to be equal to E plus I over omega C. Oh, sorry, e, this is going to be equal to E plus 1 over omega C times, times the current magnitude I. For linear circuit, if you look at, at the voltage across the inductance, VL is going to be J omega L times I at minus 9 degrees. This minus 90 degrees cancels out with this J, and then we get a real number, uh, omega Li. So we got everything in terms of real numbers right now. And the, and the way we can map this out in terms of a diagram is this line here is the source voltage minus the capacitor voltage um, as, a, as a function of the current. This line right here is the voltage across the inductor equal to omega L I. Um, the operating point that we have in this case is going to be the intersection of these two curves. So since these are both expressions for inductor voltage, they both have to hold true. And the, and the 
steady state operating point is, is going to be the intersection of these two curves. This is sometimes referred to as load and light analysis. So in this case, um, basically this inductor is like the load. Um, this line here represents kind of like the, if you can think about like the Thevenin impedance of the source. And then when you map the load line on here, the, the intersection of these two curves goes to the operating point. And there's only one operating point in this case. And so if I'm operating this circuit, you know, we're going to have simply this one voltage being a possible operating point. Now, the, the problem we run into is if we have a, a saturable inductor, a nonlinear inductor, and this is going to be the case with transformers, uh, the problem is this inductance is going to be a function of current now. So for low levels of current, we're going to have one value. For high values of current, we're going to have another value. And so as this current increases, you know, so does the magnetic field. And so if we're higher values of current, you, you, you push out in this curve. And what we're going to have is for changing current, we're going to have different smaller and smaller changes of voltage as the current increases. So the slope of this curve is changing. Um, as the current levels change. And so if we have too high value of current, we, we're pushing ourselves into the nonlinear region of the curve uh, of the circuit. So if we want to quantify this, let's suppose we have a transformer in this case, and let's suppose there's no load on it. Again, we've got our Faraday law relationship. Vs is equal to N1 times um, the change in um, flux with respect to time. We can write this change in flux with respect to time by cross-sectional area times change in the flux density with respect to time. If we assume that we have a no load condition that I2 is equal to zero, then we're going to have I1 equal to HL over N1. And then I could write this expression out for the current, which is going to be one over LM times the integral of the voltage with respect to time, which is going to be one over LM times N1 times A times B which is equal to HL over N1. And what I can do then is I can write out what LM's gonna need to be. And, and basically what, we, what we're gonna see in this case, that LM is gonna be the, the number of turns squared times the cross-sectional area over L times B over H. And the thing of it is, is that if this were linear, then B over H, that would just simply be a the permeability of this core at low values. However, if we have higher values of current, then this particular slope is going to be changing. It's actually going to be decreasing as the current goes up. And so we have a situation where this inductance is, is going to be a function of the current. Now, if I go back to my load line analysis, and if this represents the source model, now for my equivalent load on the circuit, instead of having omega times a constant L times I, I have omega times L, which is a function of current times I. And basically what I'm going to have for the relationship between voltage and current is this dash curve right here. Okay, I'm going to have this dash curve. Now what do we have for possible operating points? Well, it depends. If I'm in a low value of current, I've got kind of a, an operating point kind of similar to what I had before. However, another possible operating point would be at a higher level of current up here where I'm going to have a much higher voltage. I'm going to have a higher voltage associated with it. So what can happen in a real circuit is we can actually be jumping back and forth between operating point one and operating point two. And what this is going to give us is a very erratic voltage waveform with the currents jumping up and down as well. When would something like this occur? Well, something like this occurs in real life. For example, for transformers, we have a delta Y ground transformer. And delta would be on the high side, Y ground would be on the low side. And the situation is, is um, exacerbated by having cable capacitance. And so let's suppose we have a switch, a three-phase switch. 
we have a section of cable that ties to the high side of a transformer that's connected in delta. A lot of times what happens when we have switching operations and we're opening and closing a three-phase switch, that maybe what happens is one pull of the switch sticks. It sticks closed, all right? So if we're opening it, it stays closed. Well, what's going on here as far as the equivalent circuit? Well, the, the cable has a capacitance. You can think about having this model as the pi equivalent circuit, where for phase A, I've got a capacitance to the ground. Phase B, I have a path to ground. Phase C, I have a path to ground. So this phase A is where the stuck switch occurs. And as far as this delta connected transformer, then each of these windings has a magnetizing inductance associated, which is nonlinear. And you can see here for phase A that one possible path would be we could have current flowing through this leg of the delta connection through this capacitor to ground, and that's one series LC combination. The other combination is flowing from phase A to this other leg and then flowing through the, the capacitance for phase C. So we have two different possible paths for this ferro resonance to happen right here. All right. So anyway, what's this going to look like in the field? As I said before, um, we're going to be possibly jumping back and forth be between two operating points. So, you know, we might have something that looks like this. Here's our our magnetizing curve relationship. And we see we got two possible points, a low a value and a high value. And so this is actually from a General Electric Research um, Consortium site. Um, the consortium is referred to as D-STAR. And they've actually got not only uh, some waveforms up there, but they actually have some video, um, some audio recordings of what this actually sounds like. It kind of sounds like a garbage disposal when this ferro resonance kicks in. But what you see in the field is you see the voltage actually jumping back and forth between two different points, and it does it kind of erratically. Um, it's kind of a chaotic process where it jumps back and forth, and eventually what happens is this puts a lot of stress on the core and kind of shakes it up uh, where eventually this core could actually shake apart, right? And kind of a destructive sort of a, an effect. Um, so anyway, this is this is the ferro resonance effect. Now the th thing about ferro resonance is it's hard to sometimes know for sure whether this was actually something that destroyed a component or not because it's very, very difficult to model this, to actually get all the capacitances identified in all the situations where we're going to have unbalances and to try to characterize the magnetic circuit and account for all the damping is, is it typically a difficult thing to do. So, you know, a lot of times when something blows up, like, you know, where it has these sort of waveforms, you know, this sometimes is blamed on pararesonance. That might not actually be the case. There's a lot of different phenomena that could damage devices like transformers. Um, but, but anyway, this is something we just have to be on the guard against. And this is kind of one of the reasons why maybe utility personnel don't like putting delta high side transformers out there because they're, they're susceptible at least to ferro resonance uh, phenomena. Okay, so if, if you're interested in any more uh, references on this, uh, Greenwood's book does have a couple chapters on the magnetizing inrush and also the ferro resonance. And there's actually material up on the, the wiki site as well. But this GE site, this D-Star site, is a pretty good site because it, you know, they had a research project on this where they're trying to characterize this in the field. And they say they have some actual audio recordings of ferro resonance occurring, uh, and it's, it's very audibly noticeable. Uh, one other thing I wanted to, to mention before I wrap up this lecture is talk a little bit about the, the other types of transformer modeling that's in PSCAD. And so when you're working with PSCAD and you're selecting transformer components in the menu, you have a lot of different types of models to choose from. 
you'll see you'll have like single phase models and three phase models. There'll be models for auto transformers, which are for voltage regulation. You'll have um, what they call these UMEC types of models, these unified magnetic equivalent circuit models. And what we've been kind of focusing on here is mostly what you would have in like the the regular type of single phase model, not the UMEC model. But in PSCAD, what, what they do is they have what they call the, their classical models and their more advanced UMEC models. Basically, for the classical approach, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of neglecting the interaction um, between the windings on the core. So you're not modeling whether it's a three limb or a five limb core. It's, it's kind of almost like you're modeling, if you even have, have a three phase transformer, single phase transformers are connected up together, right? So if, if you wanted to build a three phase connection out of single phase, that's kind of what the classical approach is for. And you, the core saturation that we've been talking about, the way you'd model that in PSCAD, is just simply by adding a current injection to the regular transformer model. For the UMEC models, this is actually where you do more accurately um, model the interface coupling that occurs. So if you really wanted to do more detailed modeling of three limb and five limb models, um, you would probably want to be looking at this. And they use a more elaborate model um, for, for capturing this. So for the classical model, this is kind of similar to the model you'd have in a circuit analysis program um, for regular circuits. Basically, you'd have uh, self-inductance on the primary and secondary side. You've got mutual inductance between the two windings. So this is the two by two relationship you'd have for a single phase transformer. And then what you would need to do is you need to relate L11, L12, and L22 to quantities that power system engineers would use. Because these, this type of model is what more of the circuits people would use uh, for their analysis. So what the PSCAD program does is if you have more of a power system model where you have, say, like this T equivalent, where you have the primary secondary impedances and the core effect, what they basically do is they basically then would translate between the primary and secondary inductances, let's say, and then how this would relate to L11, L12, and L22 in this, in this circuit model. And if you go to the PSCAD manual, they have some sample calculations for, for how this is actually done. So this is more of a conventional transformer model, which you know, it's kind of like to say the circuits people would do for their power, for their electronic circuits. Now, what they do in the classical model when they represent saturation is you would actually have a nonlinear relationship. What they would actually do is they would represent saturation more simplistically. It's, it's basically kind of a two curve fit. So if everything's linear, um, basically you wouldn't have any saturation effect at all. Um, but then when you get above a certain level of voltage and current, what they would do is they would shift over to another curve. And so what, they're, what they would talk about in their documentation is they would, they would talk about having this air core reactance uh, which basically is associated with the, with the particular slope of this curve once you're in heavy duty saturation. So it's like a two piece fit in a way. Uh, and this, um, basically this knee point right here would be about 15% above, um, corresponding like 15% above the rated voltage. Sorry. So, so anyway, the way this would work in EMTP, and I'll do an example uh, in another video for, of a model I built, is what they would do is they model the extra amount of current you see over and above the steady state current by actually just injecting a standalone current into the transformer model. So basically, once you get outside uh, a certain voltage range, then basically what you do is you kind of turn 
this air core reactants on. And then what that does is that gives you a second current injection that's basically used to model that extra amount of current that you would actually see in the model. And we'll see this when I, when I do the, the PSCAT example. The UMEC approach, like I say, what this is actually doing is modeling the interaction between the windings due to the type of core design that you have. And so where the classical model would just model this coupling, what the UMEC model does is it also models the fact that you've got mutual coupling between A and B phase windings. And so this involves a more complicated matrix relationship, which is actually six by six, because then you would have a, an A phase high and low side winding uh, for each of the three phases, the A, B, and C. And what this does, this gives you a six by six matrix. And so what they do in the UMEC model is they basically take information about the core design in terms of the cross-sectional area and everything. And then they use that to estimate what those um, six by six terms would be. All right. So anyway, I, I got a single phase model and I'll, and I'll go through this a little bit um, later when I, when I go through the, the the PSCAT analysis. Um, but what I'll do to start with is I'll, I'll run through the um, hand example first. And then what I'll do is I'll go through and run through the uh, PSCAT example for you. And, and I'll put those in separate videos. All right, thank you.